Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the 17th episode of the Afghan Eye podcast. I'm your host, Sangar Paikar. And I'm Ahmed Walid Kalkar. On this episode, we are discussing the legacy of King Amanullah Khan. Why? Because as we are recording, it's the 19th of August, exactly 101 years after Afghanistan gained its independence. So uh, before we go dive into the today's topic, I would like to thank all our patrons on our Patreon page, people who have been supporting us in the last couple of months. Thanks to your uh, donations, we have made recently new purchases, as you may might have noticed my dear friend Ahmad Walid Kakar is very bright and shiny and uh, the, the guys who are watching this on YouTube you will see that he is very well lit and that's because we have purchased a new professional light for him and uh, slowly but surely we are gaining more and more uh, experience and we are acquiring more equipment in order to build this podcast and grow this podcast and as we are going ahead uh, we also would like to call all our new listeners if you are just tuning in uh, if you're listening to this podcast via a, any of the streaming services or if if you're watching this podcast on YouTube, you can uh, support our cause. You can join the Avran I move movement. Visit our Patreon page, um, or you can uh, donate via PayPal. And uh, since last episode, we are also accepting Bitcoin. So if you want to donate with Bitcoin, uh, it's also possible. And we also have a shop now. We are selling our own T-shirts. Uh, the link to our shop is also in the description box of our YouTube videos and in the show notes of the podcast. So uh, if you're watching or if you're listening in both cases, you can access all our links. And uh, without further ado... You know, uh, I would have worn the T-shirt. I would have worn the T-shirt for today. I actually suggested it to Sangad, but he rightly yeah. pointed out that I would look stupid with the turbans. But yeah, you know. but yeah. Speaking of turbans, for people who are listening and not seeing what's happening here while we're recording, actually we are entirely dressed up in traditional Afghan attire with the turbans and we are going to explain why we are wearing these clothes today all the way at the end of the show so uh, bear with us all the way till the end uh, anyways uh, so uh, as I said we are going to talk about the legacy of King Amanullah Khan and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very significant figure in Afghanistan's history because he was the ruler of Afghanistan when Afghanistan became an independent state. Um, the details of that, uh, uh, we will discuss some of the details of how that uh, came about. Uh, so first of all, I want to ask Ahmad Walid Kakar, our in-house historian, can you... <laughs> Briefly, give me a background on who was Amanullah Khan. Okay, sure. So Amanullah Khan was the, the monarch of Afghanistan between 1919 and 1929. And the reason I use the word monarch is uh, deliberate because um, I cannot factually say, we cannot factually say that he was the king because up until 1926, he actually held the title of Amir. And after 1926, it was when he became king or shah. Uh, he was the son of Habibullah Khan, grandson of Abdurrahman Khan. Uh, and from there, a great, great grandson of Amir Dost Muhammad Khan, who was essentially the founder of the Muhammad Zaid dynasty. And he was the last uh, king of Afghanistan. His brother, Inayatullah, ruled for three days. Uh, but the last uh, three for three days after him, in Ayatollah ruled. But the last meaningful ruler amongst Amir Dost Muhammad Khan's descendants was Amanullah Khan. Okay, so uh, when did he exactly become the ruler, and how did he become the ruler? Okay, so this is a question that no one actually has a proper answer to. But um, essentially, his father, Habibullah Khan, was the Amir before him. And um, 
Habibullah Khan, throughout the First World War, resisted a lot of pressure from the Ottoman Empire and Germany to join in the First World War against Britain. Now, obviously, Habibullah Khan could not attack Britain from Afghanistan. What they wanted him to do was to attack British India uh, and to sort of start an insurrection amongst the Afghans of the frontier and the Muslims in general amongst British India. Uh, until the end of the First World War, Habibullah Khan refused, uh, which you could object to on the basis of uh, Islamic sol solidarity, but also Afghanistan was very poor and he didn't see it in his interest to destabilize his country by going to war with Britain. So Habibullah Khan died in very mysterious circumstances. He was on a hunting trip near Jalalabad. Um, he was killed and in the ensuing sort of chaos, Amanullah seized control of the government. Uh, he forced his uncle Nas Nasrullah to uh, abdicate, to sign a document abdicating. He imprisoned his uncle and his uncle later died in that imprisonment. And it was as a result of his father's assassination that Amanullah became the Amir. So uh, there is a uh, maybe a short sidetrack, but there is a conspiracy theory going around that he may have been involved in assassination of his own father. Uh, how would you assess this uh, I mean, theory? I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't rule it out. Uh, I wouldn't. I mean, in our part of the world, I'm sure everyone can relate that conspiracy theories hold a lot of currency amongst people uh it's certainly no i mean it's certainly not impossible uh and i guess the fact that he was so quick to seize the opportunity to gain power for himself would yeah. only lend credence to that theory but i guess at the end of the day it's very difficult to tell but the suspicion yeah. has always been there to the extent that i think it's gone beyond just the conspiracy theory to not to a widely held suspicion okay okay fine so uh we have a uh, young man uh, who was obviously uh, educated he came from a royal family and he became the ruler of Afghanistan and can you give us a little bit of context of political uh, situation of Afghanistan vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the British Empire so that okay, we can dive okay, sure. into so, so we hear often, and you mentioned there at the beginning of the podcast, right? Afghanistan gained its independence from Britain after the Third Anglo-Afghan War. Now, what does independence mean? Uh, independence would obviously mean that prior to gaining it, there was a st state of dependency, and dependency comes in various shapes and forms. So, in British India, you had direct British rule in most areas, and in other areas, you had princely states. Afghanistan was never directly colonized. Uh, or conquered by the British. What Amanullah Khan did was he regained independence of Afghanistan's foreign affairs. So we discussed the Treaty of Gandamak in the last podcast. And in the Treaty of Gandamak, there was a stipulation that Afghanistan would forfeit its control over its foreign affairs, and its foreign affairs would be conducted entirely through British India. Now, after the Third Anglo-Afghan War, which Amon Khan launched as a jihad, uh, that right of, uh, of um, independent foreign uh, policy making reverted back to Kabul, and that was recognized by the British as well. So that is the way in which Afghanistan regained its independence. It's noteworthy to say that Afghanistan, as we know it today, was not colonized or administered by the British Empire, but areas at the time that could be considered Afghanistan, like the frontier provinces of India, Pashtunkhwa, uh, you know, parts of Balochistan or Waziristan, there could be an argument made that these were areas of Afghanistan as seen at the time that came under uh, British uh, control. Okay. So uh, we have... Uh uh, the, 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 the situation where he wanted to uh, gain independence from uh, Britain, uh, from the uh, British Empire. Uh, can you explain how uh, uh, that exactly happened? What, what, what was the situation like? Like, did he, uh, did he have an elaborate plan and how sure. did he do that? 
I mean, so so what happens is that upon seizing control of the throne, Amman Allah Khan, we could actually argue that there wasn't a need for a war and that war itself with Britain was a political ploy. And what I mean by that is that when Amman Allah came to the throne, he started to um, appoint foreign ambassadors. He appointed his father-in-law, Mahmoud Tarzi, who's seen as you know, a great intellectual and the father of modern journalism. He appointed his father-in-law as foreign minister. He appointed ambassadors. And that in and of itself breaks the understanding and the agreement with British India that Afghanistan would have no foreign relations except with British India. So let, let me just clarify that. The agreement stipulates that Afghanistan is to have no foreign relations with anyone except India, with British India, and British India will take care of its foreign affairs. When Amman Allah Khan appoints a foreign minister and appoints ambassadors to other countries that are not British India, he's doing it in flagrant violation of that agreement. Okay? So technically, we could say Afghanistan, Amman Allah was already acting independently as a monarch, as a statesman, prior to the war with Britain. Now, whilst Britain, or British India more correctly, was assessing what the correct response to Afghan, uh, Afghanistan and Amman Allah's violation was, it was then that Amman Allah, because a lot of discord in the royal court, uh, because of divisions or whatever in society between sort of nationalist factions and modernist factions and religious factions, the best move for Amman Allah was to declare not just a war of independence, but a jihad. And we could say it was very successful in that, and that he cemented his place on the throne. But was war in, completely necessary? I mean, there's a case to be made that it wasn't. Okay, so uh, he declared jihad. Who were the people that he mobilized to go and fight for him? So he had his own army, uh, and his army was split in three different... Um, I'm not a military expert here, so I don't know. I don't want to use the word division as a military term, but there were three parts of his army. Uh, one of them stationed in Khost, one of them in Kandahar, and one of them in Nangarhar. Uh, the one that was in Khost was actually commanded by General Nadir Khan, who later on became the king of Afghanistan as well, who was also a Muhammad Zay from the royal clan from a different branch of Allah. And the Afghan army was mobilized as well as that uh, letters and petitions went out to the Afghan tribes on the other side of the Durand line. Once again, when I say the Afghan tribes, uh, back in these days, Afghan and Pashtun synonymous. When we say Afghan, we mean it in the ethnic sense. Uh, these tribes joined Amman Allah, uh, specifically the Wazirs and the Mahsuds within Waziristan. Yeah, and what was their situation like before they joined uh, in? So, so the British had obviously adopted the policy of divide and rule. Uh, for these tribes, they manipulated tribal tribal rivalries. A lot of these, um, a lot of uh, their soldiers, uh, all, a lot of their militias were staffed by members of the by these tribesmen. And as well as that, there was obviously almost constant uh, armed rebellion or resistance against uh, British rule. And it must be noted that this took place sporadically uh, in different areas. You know, you had one, you had a massive rebellion in 1897, but almost constantly, especially in Waziristan, you had armed uh, resistance to British rule. So what the Afghans did, uh, what the Afghan government did, especially General Nader Khan and Khost, was he encouraged many of these Wazir and Masood tribes uh, to, you know, launch an insurrection against the British. And this is documented, and this was so successful, in fact, that many uh, members of British militias actually defected and joined the Afghan side. And yes. I read that, I read that in sort of a internal, uh, you know, if anyone wants to reference, they can ask for it on Twitter. It's actually an internal sort of British uh, Indian government memorandum where this is all detailed. So uh, Amon Khan decided to mobilize um, Afghan tribes in the occupied parts of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we could. And yeah, so the occupied tribes uh, of Afghanistan, they were uh, incited to go and fight a war on his behalf. 
Uh, how did that end up? How, how, can you tell up, me? It, it didn't end up very well because we need to we need to understand here that the boundary between British India and Afghanistan was the Durand Line, and the Durand Line was an agreement, was a demarcation. It wasn't, I don't think, meant as a permanent formal border at the time, but a demarcation of sovereignty, and that was a that line was agreed to by Abdul. Sorry, Amman Allah's grandfather Abdul Rahman. Now, especially. Especially in Waziristan, what General Nadir Khan was under the impression that uh, the tribes, the Afghan tribes on the other side of the Durand lines were fundamental to securing Afghanistan's security. He didn't just view these tribes as strategic uh, sort of assets to, uh, you know, low blow the British. He saw them as actually fundamental to securing Afghanistan. Now, these tribes, after the signing of an armistice between Afghanistan and British India, these tribes continued fighting, some of them even for five years after the Anglo-Afghan War. That was because uh, uh, Nadir Khan was under the impression that uh, in the aftermath of a peace agreement, these tribes would be reincorporated back into Afghanistan. As it turns out, that's not what happened, because in the peace agreement, in the Anglo-Afghan Treaty, Amman Khan once again confirmed that he recognized the Durand Line as the official boundary between his kingdom and British India, and he basically left the tribesmen in the dark to fight their rebellion on their own after instigating their rebellion. Okay, so, so what, uh, what happened afterwards on the other side of Durand line with those tribes? So a lot of these tribes, like I said, they continue to, some of them even continue to fight five years afterwards. Uh, you know, uh, there was a British decision to stay, stay, to put in place a permanent garrison uh, in, uh, I think it was North Waziristan. Uh, yeah, in North Waziristan. So war carried on whilst Amman Allah sort of came back to Kabul and was received as a hero uh, for, for guaranteeing Afghan independence and leaving his allies out in the cold. Okay, so uh, I have a book here. Uh, mm -hmm. I have mentioned this book uh, in the podcast with Dr. Nafisa Rahman. Um, I'm not sure if you can see it. It's mm -hmm. called The Afghanistan, the Khpalwake, Aw Nijat Tarikh. It's a book uh, written by. Um, uh, Ghazi, yeah, his name is Yar Muhammad Khan Waziri, okay. and he was a tribal leader from Waziristan who participated on the, on the Afghan side or the Pakistan side. Uh, yeah, so uh, from the other side of the okay. line, and he uh, is someone who participated in the uh, rebellion of. Uh, uh, um, 1898. Okay, yeah. Think, yeah. And then later on uh, in the War of Independence and he uh, tells his side of the story. He was, mm -hmm. He's very pro Amman Khan in this book, okay? Okay. Um, but he does mention how uh, the tribes uh, in Waziristan were systematically punished yeah, like uh, uh, their their entire region was uh, bombed. They were using uh, air raids on Waziristan uh, that they even killed their cattle, leave their wives and women, children. They they totally destroyed the region, and uh, what he describes is horrific, you know. And uh, what 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 really puzzles me is that. Um, on the one hand, we have this uh, sense that we are all one, other side of Durand line and this side of Durand line. But then at the same time, we have gained our independence at their expense. So, yeah, I mean, that was a very, it was a very elaborate uh, PR campaign by Amman Allah to... Mm -hmm. um, uh, essentially, he stopped, he suspended hostilities with the British one month into the campaign. Uh, and there was a lot of pressure for him to continue this jihad. Uh, because in the popular imagination, jihad doesn't last for one month. But there was an elaborate PR campaign in which it was said that the British had sort of come begging and pleading and agreed to all of his terms and whatever. So, you know, it's just... 
the hostilities were suspended, the people on the other side of the line who did quite a lot of the fighting themselves, who probably had a very large role in gaining Afghanistan's independence, were left out in the cold to deal with the British again. So, yeah, because that's that's an interesting point. So uh, the British army, uh, their troops were stationed on the other side of the Durand line. So when he declared jihad, most of the fighting was along the territory. Durand line. Exactly. It was on their territory. Uh, and he, as the king, he gained his independence. Uh, Afghanistan became an independent country. But... Uh, the people who uh, suffered most of the violence and who gave uh, all the, uh, you know, resisted, gave the, the, the people who resisted against the British, they remained occupied and colonized. Such is the sad story. Okay, so this is another perspective on Afghanistan's uh, independence that uh, it, I think, you know, uh, for most people who are listening and watching, it's important to think about it because uh, we are providing a counter narrative and we want people to understand Afghanistan, its current situation and its history um, in a very holistic manner. And mm -hmm. that also means that we have to think about consequences of certain historic events and how we should interpret that today. Uh, so, yeah, um, 